Hey, Ella, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Hi, Graham. Thanks for having me. Good to see you both. Oh, yeah, this will this will be a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, right away, I heard you had the sighting in, in Israel and I was thinking, well, that's where I kind of had a, I had a pretty big life changing moment in 1990 in Israel. Wow. So, I mean, I thought we could start with, uh, with your personal experiences, maybe. And we've got a lot to talk about your, your book, like who's who in the cosmic zoo, um, number one, but the fourth edition, it's huge. It's like an encyclopedia for anybody that wants to know about like ETs, UFOs, disclosure, everything. I mean, you got everything in there. But I mean, your experiences are really profound too. Maybe we can start with that, like your, your, your Israel thing, and then maybe what happened after that in 1995, I think it was. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Graham. Um, well, yes, I, I did go to school in Israel. And um, so it was in the 70s, uh, from 1976 to 1979. And I lived in the Negev desert. Uh, and there was like nothing there for miles. Like you had to take a bus and travel an hour to get to the closest city, which was Beersheba. So we we lived um, on uh, David Ben uh, Gorion's. Um, uh, he started. There was a kibbutz, which is like a mile away, and then there was the field school where I went to school, and um, he was buried there. That's where he lived. So he, that's why it's connected to um, the Ben Gurion University, which actually is in Beersheba, but this was like an arm of it, the Biological Research Center of the Negev. So um, anyway, I was in a um, relatively small group. Um, there was about 35 of us living there alone in the desert. And, you know, there's no lights at night and, and we would go out and see we called them spaceships. And, you know, I later learned that that we did, you know, America, the world, we did have some satellites up in space at that time, but not to the extent that we have today. So um, one thing led to another. And um, we used to see these something, okay, craft, I don't know what, coming and going in the desert during the day. Okay. So like at night we would see the lights, but then during the day, the, you know, there wasn't like a cloud in the sky. It was like a bluebird sky. There was no weather, you know, it's just hot and dry, just normal desert heat. And then all of a sudden, like something was either coming or going and kicking up a lot of dust and and we were just completely covered in in dust. So I, I you know I was always kind of um, interested in how that happens. They call them chamsin, sandstorms, which are kind of common in desert uh, uh, areas. But but there was nothing to create it. There was no wind, you know. And sometimes when there's weather and there's wind, okay, well then that's logical that it kicks up the dust, but there was no weather wind. So I believe what was happening there were uh, ships, craft coming and going through some portal in the desert. So um, fast forward into the 1990s, I uh, became, I started going down all these rabbit holes because as you mentioned, I had a, another experience in 1995. Um, I was living in Florida on uh, Indian Rocks Beach, which is the Gulf of Mexico. And, and so uh, the sun sets in the West and that was something that we used to do at night. It was just like a ritual going to the beach to watch the sunset. And um, I, you know, one night it was just warm, balmy, not a cloud in the sky. Uh, the sun was down, the stars were out. And, you know, a lot of my, my neighbors and I, we used to just hang out on the beach just because it was comfortable. And all of a sudden I start to hear rumbling and swishing sounds coming out of the water. And, uh, you know, it's not unusual to have dolphins, a pod of dolphins come close because they, they feed, you know, there's like fish around and people fish there and stuff. But 
and then I started, it wasn't a dolphin and, or any dolphin, any animal. And, and then I started to see metallics uh, emerge out of the ocean. And, and I was like about a hundred yards uh, away, you know, I was on the shoreline and um, it, it just like emerged out of the ocean. It was this uh, silver disc shaped uh, craft there weren't any visible lights. Um, it was like the size of a football field. And it just hovered for like about a minute and all the ocean foam and the water was just kind of swishing off of it. It was almost like it was hovering to get clear of the water. And then it shot up into the sky like in a New York second. And I watched it become as small as the stars. And then I saw some kind of like, it looked like a little hole that it looked like it, it created and it just disappeared. And I believe that was some sort of portal in space and then it just disappeared. Well, <laughs> needless to say, I was completely, you know, gobsmacked and shocked and I never seen anything like that. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And so I tell my friend and who um, he was at the time, by the way, just let me give you a context. I was teaching these classes in um, St. Pete, uh, Indian Rocks Beach, St. Pete area um, called ETs, Aliens or Angels. My focus was on the beings. OK, so that's the first book that you um uh, mentioned the A to Z compendium because, you know, we were trying to figure out like our abduction experiences. I had never really seen, uh, you know, a, like, like a UFO like that before. Okay. Um, so that's what got me started down ufology, like actual down those rabbit holes to figure out what the heck was going on. Why was it coming out of the ocean? And so that night, okay, so I was telling a friend who was involved in my classes, you know, they knew, they, everybody knew me, uh, what I did. And he was a member of MUFON at the time. I wasn't, I am now. <laughs> but, uh, and he told me that they received 350 calls uh, that night um, from various people along the, the beaches there who saw the same craft from like different angles. And uh, so I know that I wasn't alone and I wasn't alone on the beach either. So did, did your friends see it that were there with you or? Yeah. My name, I mean, we were just like, what the heck? Like everybody was in shock, you know, um, we didn't know any, you know, and, and like, you know, at first I thought maybe it was because uh, Tampa Bay has, um, the Air Force Base there. There's a big Navy presence there. Uh, there's a lot going on in terms of, you know, our government, military and everything. So, I, I, you know, I thought well, that, that that can't be theirs. It was way too big, way too like flat. Everything was just streamlined. It didn't have anything, no engine, no nothing, no windows. No, I mean, it was just flat. So, I don't know, you know, I thought, well, maybe, and then I started learning and going down these rabbit holes and learning about that, you know, we have this secret space program that uh, has been uh, being manufactured uh, underground at various locations on the planet since World War II. So, of course, I questioned what I saw might have been that, okay, but then I started to have symptoms, okay? And um, so 1995 was the year that I kind of woke up, you know, to a lot of this stuff, as well as my own experiences. So I was being taken and abducted and used in the alien uh, human hybridization program. So it, it, exactly six months later from that sighting that I, that I had, I woke up one night, you know, I don't want to gross you guys out because, you know, but it's like female stuff. And I was thought I was having my monthly, you know what? And uh, I took like an ibuprofen and went to bed. You know, I was a little crampy and I woke up and these two 
uh, like four and a half, five foot, not even five foot, four foot tall, little gray beings with black button eyes. Okay. Not the, the usual, um, almond shaped eyes that everyone sees, but they were buttons, black buttons. They were white, little gray beings, two of them at the foot of my bed, just standing there. I woke up, I was like, oh, like that. And, and I felt all crampy and I went to the bathroom and I saw, I passed something and saw something I never saw before. <laughs> so I called my husband and then we called the emergency room and he took me straight into the emergency. They told me whatever it is, just scoop it up in a Ziploc bag and bring it down. And long story short, they had everything tested. They said that I was um, between, you know, like six to eight weeks. It was like eight weeks pregnant, you know, and they said everything was intact. I didn't need a DNC, which is usually what happens after miscarriages. Um, and the only thing missing was the fetus. <laughs> so that, whoa, you know, and I had a, like hormonal changes and I was like, you know, the next day crying, you know, on the bed, on the couch and in the daylight again, this is all happening in broad daylight. And this other being just shows up at the foot of my couch, white long, wispy hair, big, blue, human-looking eyes, okay? And, and like, this gaunt face and, and, and just stood there and said, we're the reason this happened to you. Because I was like, why is this happening? What happened? What did I do wrong? All this kind of, you know, crazy stuff that hormones do to us, you know? <laughs> and that's when I started to wake up to what was happening. So... Fast forward, um, April of 2022, last year, um, I felt really vindicated by that report that was released from the Pentagon um, that was written by these uh, doctors. Um, I think Gary Nolan, Dr. Gary, he was part of that. Uh, and they, they basically, it was a 1,500-page 1, document dump about the injuries, the biological, neurological injuries that come from having uh, contact, close proximity to alien technology, alien ships, or alien beings themselves. So when I saw that uh, and, and, and started reading through it, and I saw, you know, well, maybe that there might have been a connection between me seeing that, that craft so close you know, and then having the uh, the miscarriages afterwards. Um, I don't know, but that was just because uh, they did say missing pregnancies were part of the in, the you know on the list of injuries. Missing pregnancies. Wow, mm -hmm. where can we see those documents? Is that the FBI dump that you were talking about in your book, or? Uh, yes. Well, you, it's now, uh, declassified and it's out there. So it's, it was the Pentagon, um, defense department. It was a 1500 April. If you look it up, uh, April of, uh, 2022. Um, and it's, it's free. You can get it online. You can look at it. Cause I think two months after that is when they came up with their, their report, that 15 page report or whatever. Right. For That's right. Yeah. Yes. And it's just been one thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how what an interesting time. Isn't it? Find, I mean, especially in your case where you've had so many experiences, like not only ET, but religious experiences. I mean, you're kind of stuck in that sort of like, you know, I don't even know how to describe it, but in between religion and and, and the UFO phenomena. Yes. <clears throat> but, but do you find that the uh do you find the whole field is is more divided now or getting more divided? Because I know from from me, I I don't trust what what I'm hearing from the government now. Like it, mm -hmm. So I've always been a, a believer in ETs, but also all of the above, like you write about in your books. Like I think it's sort of everything that, that you describe as well. But um, now that the government's talking about it now, I've got less, you know, I'm less, uh, less inclined. And I know a lot of other people, like the whole sort of conspiracy realm or not the whole thing, but a, a good part of the conspiracy realm. They're like, they're now they're going towards like no ETs, you know, like it's all, 
<laughs> um, you know, government or interdimensional or demons. I mean, it just seems like ET is sort of the last on the list all of a sudden. You think? Do you think it's divide? Do you think it's more divided now or or less? Well, you know, the the Machiavellian agenda to divide and conquer has been with us all along. Okay, so if they're not if people are not divided over this, they're divided over you know, politics or gender or, you know, the religious stuff or sexuality. I mean, you name it. So, yes, I think that there's obviously division. There's always been division in ufology. There's always been different, you know, viewpoints. Now, people haven't always been on the same page. But, you know, I think with this recent disclosure era, it's, it's helped a lot of us. It, it, it's vindicating, number one. It's a, it's, a, it's a great time to be alive, to watch this unfold, to live, to see this. Because, you know, before all this, it was all conspiracy theories. And, and also the stigma that was put upon anyone who uh, was an experiencer, an abductee, a researcher. I mean, even this, the SETI, you know, I mean, remember the movie Contact? Um, which was basically written by Carl Sagan, but it was about SETI, you know, the search for extraterrestrial yep. intelligence yep. and how, and that was in the nineties, 1990s and how she, um, Ellie, you know, the main scientist who, who, who basically discovered the, the, the signal, how she was treated. Okay. For even studying it, researching it. Okay, she, you know, the, 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 it's always been an uphill battle uh, for us to get to the truth about what's going on and, uh, and wrestling with these governmental forces that are, to be fair, um, protecting us because of national security issues. And that's a, that's a huge topic, national security because not only um, about the other countries on the planet and, you know, the, the, these cold wars and economic wars and all this stuff that goes on over the tech, over the alien tech. So that, you know, and, and in some regards, the more you get down these rabbit holes, the more I see why they have been covering a lot of this stuff up. And not only that, but they've done multiple social experiments along the way, testing the waters to see how where the public is at. Are they ready for this? Are they all going to freak out? Are they all going to have a panic? Is everybody just going to go off the grid, stop paying their mortgages? They don't want that to happen. Okay. We live in a debt system. Let's face it, right? They want to keep everybody, you know, status quo, paying your bills, paying your mortgage, keeping the banks flowing. And this type of information could really upset the whole apple cart. So there, it's not just about uh, social. It's also the religious piece, which intrigues me. You brought this up because, you know, like I kind of like, where do I stand? I never felt it's like I'm not from this planet. You know, <laughs> the drugs don't work on me here. I don't know where I fit in. Am I here? Am I there? I don't know what. But and, and that's exactly what you said is exactly, you know, this whole phenomenon. And I found I was, you know, like uh, the stuff in my books it are, are pieces that that I was questioning. So I'm sharing what I found. That's it. You know, I know what I know, what I don't know, I don't know, you know, so. <laughs> so what is the, what is the, uh, where do we go from, the, where do we go from here? What is the truth and what is the scary truth that, that they don't want to tell us about? I've been recently, I've been recently thinking myself because of some of the occult stuff that they were getting involved in before the CIA got started in the 40s. So this would be like experiments they were doing in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I feel like they realize that we have more control over our reality than 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 humanity realizes that we can sort of manifest our reality. We can we can summon we can we have sort of powers. We can summon things. We can do all kinds of occult things. And I feel like that plays into ufology as well. And and it comes in it bring, it, when the CIA got started. It was like we have to just shield the public from all this knowledge because reality is way crazier and and probably way way scarier than they ever realized. 
Yes, I agree. That is a very good point. Um, they, and this goes way back to the uh, galactic wars, the, the Adam and Eve story, the genetic manipulation of humankind, because they don't want us humans to have all these extra powers, the extra sensory perceptions, the ability to manifest, uh, to be creators in our own right. Um, you know, my belief, and you, you have my first book, and I, I conclude with this, that, so I studied with Zachariah Sitchin. I met him, I interviewed him, I became one of his uh, international Bible study students. He was brilliant, very kind, very devoted. I mean, he was an amazing uh, man, okay, and he, a, a very accomplished. But, you know, Part of the stuff that he unraveled from the Sumerian texts, and, and people just ran with this without like looking at it themselves or questioning it. And then all of a sudden it starts like another religion or some cult or, you know, you know how we're prone to that stuff. That the Anunnaki, the Nibiru, Nibiruans, you know, the, the beings that come from Nibiru created humankind. So I prove that is not the case. They did not create us. We were already here, okay, based on the history, okay? So I go into, you know, like Genesis 1-1, okay? The, the Bible begins with the, what, uh, 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 the, the aftermath of the first great deluge, which was the sinking of the civilizations of Atlantis, okay? And we know this from, from Plato's account, from archeology, span uh, that, that there were more than one great floods, the great deluge all around the planet. We have evidence, archeological evidence, okay? So, so after that, and, and what happened there, okay? This is, this is key. So the story is, is that, you know, they had everything, right? They were this technological society. They had it all, but they were doing some stuff that the creator God felt was going against the laws of creation. They were mixing and matching uh, different species and different, you know, genetics and creating all kinds of like chimeras and monsters. And we have this in our mythologies. Okay. Uh, they're not like imaginary creatures. These were creatures that came out of these genetic experiments. And the creator God said, no, you can't do that. Okay. So he, he ended it because they get, they got very arrogant and, you know, pride always comes before the fall. So he ended it and caused a flood and the flood, you know, the first one, like we used to have this bubble of water uh, around the planet. And that was, so in the ancient texts, it talks about how, how that, uh, the firmament, they call it, how it got punctured because of that, that flood came out of the atmosphere but it also came from inside the earth. So then we see in the biblical text, because the Bible is a historical record. I mean, people could create all kinds of religions out of it, but just looking at it as a historical record, it says that this, you know, when they talked about the second flood, that the waters were ordered by the creator God to come out from inside the earth, as well as the rains. Okay, which is why everything got flooded so instantly, so quickly. Same thing with Atlantis. So, so I trace this timeline and I go, okay, well, the Anunnaki story, the Sumerian tale is after the first flood, not before. So that means humans were already here. Okay. And then I go into the rejected Jewish texts. So you know, because of our history of uh, the Church of Rome, uh, who basically canonized today's Bible, they did it under decrees. You know, here in America, we're supposed to be separate from church and state. But back in, in uh, the Roman Empire, the church and state were one, okay? So they made decrees that were all to do with their religion. And they decided that they were going to sort of incorporate 
the growing Christianity that was happening in the first, second, and third century. So Constantine comes along and he creates this creed. He was one of the emperors of Rome. So this became law, okay? And that was anti-Semitism, okay? Because of the Jewish Roman wars that were happening over ancient Israel at that time, okay? Or, and before, I mean, they basically, I mean, actually 70, it was early, early, like 30 to 70 AD, then they destroyed the first temple. The, the ancient Israelites went in all different directions all around the planet, which we call the diaspora. So I trace, you know, where did they end up, these lost tribes of Israel, and I find that they're all over the world. They're, you know, uh, they've gone to Europe, they've gone to China, they went to Africa, they came to America because there's, and Japan even, there's, there's evidence of them all over the place. So this is a key piece because it dovetails into the end time, pro the quintessential end time prophecy, which has to do with the new, the whole, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, that comes out of the heavens, which are the skies, okay? The word for heaven and skies is the same in Hebrew, so interchangeable, and lands over a scorched earth, okay? And then the Lord, the king of the universe, the Messiah king, he sits in the middle of it on, on a throne with an iron rod, and there's 12 gates that all open up, Okay, and they're all named after the 12 blessed tribes of Israel because there was one tribe that got cursed. So he wasn't he's not involved in the end time prophecy. And then Joseph had the double portion. So his gave it to his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there's the 12 and there's sapphire floors and crystals and gemstones. And whoa, it's phantasmagorical. That's what I call it. It sounds like a sci fi phantasmagorical mothership that comes down and basically overlays the earth. And at, at the time of that, it also says that, that the earth, because it's scorched from wars, from climate change, from the passing of Nibiru that we're, we're due for another passing, and, you know, how it gets scorched, all, all of the above, okay? Um, and, and, and that begins the new age. That begins the Aquarian age, the age to come, the, the golden age. And when I looked at this and I thought, well, when was the last time we, because, you know, things cycle, right? So we're talking about processional ages here, which are uh, 2,160 years each. So we're still at the end of the Piscean age because, because the prophecy says that all this happens at the end of this age. So we're getting, we're, we're moving towards that, but, but we're still resolving issues that the Piscean age was about, which was also called the church age. Okay. And, and the, the Bible also talks about the times of the Gentiles comes to an end at the end of the age. And the Messiah, the Lord, the King of the universe comes back and sets up his kingdom on earth through this heavenly city, this phantasmagorical mothership. So that's that's what we have to look forward to. What I looked at this and I thought, when was the last time we had an, because that's the age of Aquarius. Okay, there it is right there. When that happens, we have entered into the age of Aquarius. When was the last time the age of Aquarius happened? 12,800 years ago? No, was, well, I thought double. Wait, that's the one that's starting right double away. That. Yeah, 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 double that. Double that. 5,920? Approximately 24,000 years ago. Which so another 1,200 years? No, it's another 1,000. And well, you know, if each processional age is approximately 2,160 years and there's 12, so you can do the math. So, you know... The la that when that was going on on our planet, what was happening on our planet was the civilizations, the ancient civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria. So my original point was that uh, human beings have lived on this planet since then. The uh, first and second books of Adam and Eve 
talk about how the evidemic race, Adam and Eve, or, you know, Sitchin coined that phrase, so I adopted it, the evidemic race, which is humans, were, pu were put back on the planet after the first deluge. And that's the whole story in the book of Genesis. And basically, today's Bible canon is a brief synopsis of the, the rejected Jewish books that tell the whole story. So if only those pieces were still in the Bible, everybody would have a whole different uh, belief system and, and perspective on who we are. Sounds okay. like ET. It sounds like ET disclosure. You know, it, it's yes. It sounds like a story about you know what's going what's going on right now. So I gotta I gotta ask you: Have you read um, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean from the 1930s? I looked at it. I have not. Uh, it's well, on my pile of things to okay. read. I haven't uh, gone into it in detail, but I'm wanted, familiar with those. Yeah, I want to read you a little excerpt from it because okay, we talk about the archons and you talk about the reptilians. And I was going to ask you when you were talking about the government keeping the secrets. Like I was going to ask you if they're captured by a higher entity, whatever that is. Like let's let's say evil, even because of what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're speaking of Atlantis, like this sounds really interesting. So it says, in the form of man moved they amongst us. So something moved amongst them in the form of man. But only to sight were they as our men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men. Crept they into the councils, taking forms that were like unto men. Slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling over man. Only by magic could they be discovered. Only by sound could their faces be seen. Sought they from the kingdom of shadows to destroy man and rule in his place. Well, that pretty much sums up. I agree with uh, other research corroborates that. Okay. <laughs> uh, the fact that we have been in this uh, galactic battle, cosmic drama uh, over our form our human form. And that uh, basically dovetails into what you mentioned uh, earlier about why, uh, you know, they've been keeping all this stuff secret because they don't want us to have certain powers. So that goes back to the Sitchin material where, you know, uh, there was a misnomer that came out that, you know, he was saying that the Anunnaki created us, but actually they genetically manipulated us for the very reasons that you just stated. And they wanted to create, according to the uh, the Sumerian uh, scripts, tablets and stuff that he translated and unpacked, a slave race, okay? So, I mean, that is something that this whole planet, our planet, all of us, no matter which country you come from or which human race you're part of, everyone has been enslaved in one well, form or another. Well, I mean, you could say we're enslaved right now. I mean, when you look at the lies that are happening and what's really going on in the world, I mean, all, all of civilization in some way are just being held down and, and lied to. I mean, and we're, we're, you know, they just want us all to be sort of at the same level of poverty. It seems like. Yes. Are they, so are they under some archonic influence or, or, or uh, yes. influence or. Very much. I like that you use that word uh, archon. So you know, there's a scripture in the Bible, Ephesians 6, 12, that says, we war not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this present world, who are the archons, okay, uh, and, and uh, spiritual wickedness in the heavens, who are the aliens. So my first book just unpacks that one scripture. Who are they? Who are these powers, principalities, and rulers of the darkness? And you just said, yes. So we are every, that's why my my Monica is, you know, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Philo said that in 10 BC. And there's nothing new under the sun. So, but here's the good news, okay? And this is why, you know, I hold the beliefs that I do because of my experiences, but it says so, you know, I met Yeshua along the way, you know, in between all of this stuff. And I had a near-death experience in 2010 and saw him again. And he basically told me to rewrite that first book about the aliens with him in it. So I did. 
and it's now turned into six books. Okay. So I wasn't expecting that, but that's how it goes. So, <laughs> but here's the channel. Do you feel like um, it's channeled? No, I wouldn't call it that. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, downloads, uh, teach like, like I, you know, there's this old saying, we teach what we need to learn. Okay. And I needed to learn discernment. Okay. Cause I'm coming out of, you know, all this stuff and being fought over as a child over the religions because my, my father was an Orthodox Jew and my mother was an Italian Catholic and, and both families were going at me, you know, growing up. And when I was 13 years old in my 13 year old puberty brain, I said, when I, I, I had enough of all their mishugas and their fighting. And I said, when I grow up, I'm going to marry a Protestant. Cause I thought <laughs> that it was somewhere halfway between being Jewish and Catholic and be careful what you wish for. Cause I did. Okay. <laughs> My husband's from the Church of England, which is Protestant. Okay, so and we've been together for 33 years. So, um, so anyway, the the religious stuff definitely uh, plays a, a role in all of this. And um, I found, you know, I, you know, it's like you got to eat the meat and throw away the bones. You know, so I go in and I find these promises. OK, these prophecies, which I that's what drew me in was the prophecies. OK, I'm, I, I, because of all the mishugas I went through with the religions, I, I wasn't interested in like, oh, I want to be a good Jew. I want to be a good Christian and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to know what the heck is this about? I was tested on it in Israel. I couldn't pass like, you know, here in America, you can't pass without gym. I couldn't pass without Bible. And, and the questions were all about. You know, it was all Old Testament, obviously. It was all about the prophecies. So that is where I kind of got started. And the prophecies talk about, Isaiah 61 talks about, I have come to set the captives free. So I'm all over that. Freedom? Yes. That, that's, that's the hope that we all have to come out of this uh, matrix of enslavement, subjugation, suppression of who we were created to be. So dovetailing back into the genetic manipulation, I uncovered this and I prove that 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 the Anunnaki did obviously they did not create us, they genetically hybridized us, manipulated us and downgraded us. Because according to the Adam and Eve story, they had everything. They were walking, fired up with all 12 strands of DNA, okay, in their glory bodies. This was like they were, they had, they were made in the image and likeness of the gods. And, and they were like gods themselves. And this is where all this misnomer and all these taking things out of context. And, and yes, it's written in not just the Sumerian, the Egyptians, because the, you know, uh, ancient Egypt became inheritors of ancient At Atlantis, the land of chem, it was called, which is where we get the word chemistry from. So, uh, it, you know, so all of this history is all connected. And so, so yes, they wanted to suppress us because of the, the power struggle over who gets to be the king of the earth, who gets to be the lord of this, this realm, okay? So in the Sumerian um, material, it talks about Marduk. In fact, Sitchin talked about Marduk a lot, okay? Because Marduk was considered the he's the lord of nibiru he was the son of enkai and the, his uncle was enlil who he waged war against both of them he wanted to take over and 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 that's why they call the planet mars uh, after him okay and mars used to be like earth so i find it ironic okay that here we have uh, in this day and age, you know, August of 2023, you know, the, the Artemis um, program, uh, NASA's Artemis program, which is their, their goal to occupy Mars 
through establishing a lunar base on the moon. And that's their first step is to send uh, people, the first woman they're going to put in space and going to the moon. They want to set up a, a, a base so that they can launch rockets from the moon to Mars because they know that this planet is going to get wrapped up soon. I mean, soon, relatively speaking. I mean, not tomorrow, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Because what happened in the past, it's going to go through another uh, pole shift. We're already 40 degrees into it. Um, the reason for the, the, the climate change and the warming, it's not about us. Okay, I need to put that out there because they tried to, there's another huge manipulation back in the 90s with Al Gore's, you know, inconvenient truth. And they wanted to just market you with these curly light bulbs and guilt trip you that, that it's your fault that the warming is happening. It is not our fault. It's the sun. Okay, the sun is perturbed. And the whole, well, the whole solar system is perturbed, as a matter of fact. And why? Because we're getting ready for another flyby from Nibiru. But Nibiru isn't alone, okay? The, the nemesis Nibiru system has seven planets, 10 moons. So Nibiru is the only one out of that seven that is uh, elongated, tilted, doesn't orbit well with the others, you know, kind of like the redheaded stepchild and, and comes in and creates um, cataclysms and disasters. And this is evidenced by the past. And I thought, well, gee, you know, and then you have these two prophecies that, uh, that corroborate one in the old Testament and one in the book of revelation that basically pro a promise of God that he's going to recreate the heavens and the earth. Now, again, remember the word heavens in Hebrew is interchangeable with the skies, okay? So we have to keep that in mind because when people think heaven, they think, oh, the stars or people are going to heaven, which is, you know, another word like paradise. But this is about the cosmos, okay, and the skies above and what we see. And that's another end time prophecy in Matthew 24 that there will be signs. How, the, the disciples said to him, how do we know when to expect you, when you're going to return? And he said, well, I'll be back at the end of the age and there'll be signs in the heavens. There'll be signs in the sun, signs in the moon, signs in the stars, signs in the skies. And when I saw that and I looked at the Hopi prophecies, Okay, Native, Native American Hopi tribes, they talk about the, the blue and the red kachina. And, and they say, when you see the blue kachina, know that the red kachina is going to follow and that there was going to be colors in the sky. And when you see colors in the sky, know that it's here. Well, we are there. We are seeing colors in the sky almost on a daily basis. And those colors are a combination of things. Um, the chem trailing, which, you know, puts a lot of chemicals into the atmosphere, and that's happening all over the planet, even right above you guys in Calgary. <laughs> you oh, yeah. see it too. Yeah. And so, you know, they're trying, this is, this started in the 1980s. So uh, in, in the Reagan administration, it all began, it, it really all got initiated there. And he, President Ronald Reagan, dubbed the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. So that's why I have in, in my fifth book, uh, The Real Star Wars, because this is part of the secret space program, what they've been planning, what they've been preparing for, because they know what's coming. They've been tracking this for decades. And I traced the blackout, okay? So there was never a blackout on studying Nibiru or what they called Planet X. Now, we wouldn't be calling it Nibiru if it wasn't for Zachariah Sitchin, okay? Because he's the one that brought that Sumerian word to us. So Planet X and Nibiru are kind of one and the same. However, all the astronomers who were studying our solar system were, were looking at the perturbations on the last planet that they discovered, so, like, you know, they saw perturbations on... What's a perturbation? 
That's a good question. So it sounds like disturbed and it is. So it's like they saw that there were um, anomalies, uh, inconsistencies to the orbits. So when they uh, they discovered, um, okay, so so before they discovered, they read it. Let me let me reword that. They rediscovered it because it's always been there. It was just hidden from them. Uh, the planet Uranus. Okay, I'm saying it properly just to avoid all the jokes because everybody loves to joke about that name, but it's pronounced Uranos, named after the, the Greek god of, of lightning. So they saw perturbations, anomalies uh, in, uh, in, in its orbit. So that's how they were able to, dis to rediscover the planet Neptune, which was beyond it. And then again, years later in the 1930s, uh, they 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 just they saw there was another they had something was and they were constantly searching for planet X. They thought there was another there had to be another planet and yes there was and it was Pluto. Okay, so in the 1930s by uh, uh, Percival Lowell he discovered Pluto based on the perturbations that he saw in Neptune. And then even after Pluto was discovered, they still continued seeing perturbations at the edge of the solar system and which we also call the Oort cloud, okay? And now we have what they call planet nine. So in my book, I kind of unpack all this because they demoted Pluto, okay? So Pluto was planet nine, all right? So planet X, like you can, you can use the word X as like the X factor or the Roman numeral X, which is the number 10, okay? But th this all dovetails into the cover-up of Nibiru, which began under the Reagan administration in, the in 1983 through an executive order. When they saw, and I, I unpacked this in my fifth book, The Heavens, um, they saw uh, through Iris, um, the, the interface, uh, uh, you know, they, they sent a probe out and uh, to the edge of the solar system and it came back with a picture of Nibiru, okay? And once he saw that, he thought, wait a second, we have to, this is national security, we have to cover this up. No one is allowed to even use the word Nibiru. They wanted to delete it out of the dictionary and, and, and no scientist. And then all well, that's when the blackout began. And I met Sitchin in um, May of 1995 at, at, in Washington, D.C. at the When Cosmic Cultures Meet conference. And it was, and I didn't know any of this stuff uh, when I met him, okay? I found this out afterwards. But that was about a year and a bit after he had this monumental interview uh, with the NASA astronomer, uh, the chief astronomer of NASA, uh, Robert S. Harrington. And Robert S. Harrington was tracking Nibiru, okay? And he, they were in charge of all of this stuff with all the space tech, all right? And, the, and, and so, so they, he agreed to, an, and you can actually Google, you could find this. And they sat down and it was um, basically, uh, uh, Sitchin was comparing his notes, which he was uh, uh, drawing on the ancient texts, and and Harrington is drawing on the current um, uh, uh, space tech, uh, uh, you know, the astronomy. And they met in the middle, and they were like, "Yes," like they corroborated. It was a it was a a, a real monumental point. And all of a sudden, after that. This guy, 50 years old, perfectly healthy, comes down with esophageal cancer and just dies. Wow. The NASA so, guy? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, and, you know, there goes the conspiracy. There's an, another conspiracy for people to un unpack. And so, um, so is, that a, is that a whole solar system that's coming through our galaxy then? And it's kind of in some sort of weird overlap or collision with the Milky Way? Or, I mean, with uh, with our solar system? Um, yes, it, it, we are actually a binary system. Our sun has a binary twin, and I, I, which, which I call nemesis. We call it nemesis, and it's a brown dwarf star. 
and we don't see it because it, it's usually behind the sun. But when it when it uh, moves to the side, then our sun illuminates it. Okay, and then it's and then it looks like two suns. Um, and the ancients wrote about this. In fact, it's written in stone. It's in the temples. That's what all the red the Egyptians they they worship this red disc with the wings. Okay, which is all Nibiru. It's that's great that you meant that you uh, that you kind of unpacked all that because I you know it's something that I've I get confused on because I've also heard in the mainstream it seems mainstream astronomy over the last let's say three to five years that that there is acceptance of this planet X kind of thing. And then I just, so I, and then I, and then I hear that it's not, and it is. And so it's just one of those topics that I just don't even look into. It's like, I just, it's too confusing to, to wrap your head around. Like, where are we at now with an official say on, on whether there is this sort of rogue system or not? Well, I, I don't work for the government, so I can't give you an official say uh, but I can tell you that that the cover up or the truth embargo, okay, is connected to the U is to the UFOs, right? So UFO cover up and Nibiru cover up are intertwined, and I prove this through the historical, you know, not not deep history, but since the 80s. Yeah, yeah, since, yeah. Since President Reagan. So so he did this executive order. These executive orders get sort of rolled into the next president. And then they either like just kind of keep it going and roll it into their own executive right, order right. that comes under the heading of national security. And <laughs> Uh, did Trump, did Trump let it go? I was just about to mention him. I'm so glad you mentioned him. So it wasn't until Trump's administration did that particular piece get released. Wow. Maybe that's why it started to come out then. Mm, yeah. I mean, well, so here, so in my fifth book, I go into all this, um, you know, the astronomy dramas, okay? The the Berkeley, the uh, Cal University of Berkeley, California, with uh, you know Brown and 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 you know the I uh, International uh, Astronomy Union and how they why they demoted Pluto. Okay, so even the NASA chief who came here to Colorado to see you Boulder to talk to the the students even said, "Oh yeah, Pluto's a planet. How do I know? We've been there." OK, and uh, he wasn't buying this Pluto's not a planet thing. So I included all of his remarks in, in my chapter because I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Pluto's a planet. We grew up with Pluto being a planet. The Sumerians actually uh, had it in uh, etched in their stone. In fact, that's what Sitchin's 12, uh, the 12th planet book he, he, it was all about was he explained that because this the uh, Sumer the the Sumerians wrote this because the Anunnaki come in from outside the solar system. They come in, um, you know, everything comes through this Oort cloud. So they count from out to in instead of we count from in to out. Okay. So the 12th, that's where, where the 12th, and they also counted the sun and the moon as uh, luminaries. So that's where the 12th planet heading came from so they 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 went to a lot of uh trouble to debunk uh sitchin to um a lot of it was uh driven by a combination of anti-semitism and the fact that they wanted to cover this up okay so when i met him which uh was in may of 1995 and and I sat in on his lectures and he came here to Colorado uh, three times after that. This, everyone asks the same question. When? When is Nibiru going to pass the earth again? And his, his answer was always, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And, and he died in 2010. So he was right about that. It didn't happen in his lifetime, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen in ours. But what was behind a lot of that was the powers that be sort of came down a little heavy because of this uh, interview with him and Harrington. And 
they didn't want this stuff coming in. They, they basically threatened him and said, look, if you're going to give uh, coordinates and times and that kind of data, we're going to shut you down. So he didn't want to get shut down. He had so much knowledge and so much information to put out there. So he never mentioned that. And he was he, he kept that. But he was when I met him, he was clearly a little shaken and a little tight lipped, very tight lipped, but but uh, shaken like it was like it was like, oh, don't go there. Don't talk about that with him. And and he lived uh, to a ripe old age. He, he was he died in his 90s and and of natural causes. They didn't they didn't do him in and. He left this legacy of all this, you know, the Earth Chronicles, it's called, his 12 books. And, um, you know, a lot of us, you know, I see research as like a baton race. You know, the next person gets the baton and just unpacks it even more and goes with it. So, you know, I, I just took this piece, not the whole thing, and tried to sort of unravel how that affects us today and what this, the prophecies mean. So the prophecies about, and so 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 uh, Isaiah sixty one about I have come to set the cast free. That that's the Messiah. And then when Yeshua walked the earth, and and in uh, the book of Luke, his story when he um, uh, read the uh, the Torah, this piece of the Torah portion, and the synagogue in Jerusalem, which is that famous piece, and he said, I have come to set the captives free, and this has been fulfilled today and everybody went nuts. Okay. So, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I have to say I am a witness. Okay. You know, and, and in a court of law wit a witness, I testimony is considered legal evidence. And I have seen him six times. And one of those was a near death experience. He is very much alive uh, the, the, you know, he was resurrected and he's still alive and he is returning with armadas, armies, legions of, of angels of heaven, of extraterrestrials. So these are the good ETs. So when, when, this, when do you think that uh, I've got a million questions for you? Can you stay a few extra minutes here? Or? Oh, of course. Sure. Yeah, so, so when do you when when is your sense that that's going to happen? Because uh, interestingly enough, that Emerald Tablets has Thoth Thoth is returning as well. Thoth is is returning to to basically do the same thing. So I don't know if they got that from you know from Yeshua or, or the or Christ, but it's very similar. There's a lot of a lot of this. So what 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 is your sense with ev with everything going on now with disclosure and this ramping up? Like because I always think that with the accelerated disclosure. All these people are starting to believe that never believed before. There's way more researchers into it now. It's it's expanding like crazy. And how is the phenomena going to react to this increase in consciousness? So, do you think it's going to happen fairly soon? Uh, yes. I'm. I mean, we're in it. It's happening. Even as you and I speak, we're we're you know bringing this up to the surface. So this is all about the expansion of our of consciousness and the age of knowledge. We are in the age of knowledge. Um, so the processional ages, okay, so when the age uh, shifts, we are, in the, we are in the transition right now. So remember the song in the 60s by the fifth dimension, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Yeah. That's where we are at. But it's like it's an analogy to the sun uh, coming up in the morning. So you can go out and you can see dawn. And the, you get, it starts to get light, but the sun is not above the horizon. And it might take about an hour for the sun to actually come up, and then you start to see the rays. So it, 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 as an analogy, that's where we're at in the dawning of the next age. So we're transitioning between the two ages, which is why a lot of people think this is the age of Aquarius because of all of our technology, okay? And that is part of the overlap and the transition to prepare us for the true age of Aquarius, but the true age of Aquarius is when these these beings return. The God and Thoth, I believe, was uh, Hanoch, Enoch. Okay, so a lot of them had different names. 
uh, in different languages from different cultures, but of course, you know, Egypt and Israel and, you know, they were very connected. So yes, uh, there is uh, prophecies that talk about the, the ancient gods returning to harvest the earth. In fact, Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew, um, uh, 1339, talks about that at the end of the age, the, uh, the harvest uh, will be by the angels. So there's angels. So who are the angels? So I, I wrote a book. My third book is basically all about who are the angels. And, you know, we've been conditioned to believe that angels are these, you know, beautiful uh, winged, you know, Renaissance pictures, which was artistic depictions, but that's not who they really are. Okay. And they have the ability to fly, but they're every time an angel shows up in the Bible, in the Old Testament, any, and in the New Testament, they're men. Okay. They're human looking men. That doesn't mean that they don't a shape shift or they can they have all these powers and abilities but the the you know um good angels and bad angels good angels and bad angels yes i was just about to mention that so there was a of the battle there was an angelic war and one third of heaven's angels rebelled against the king of the universe the creator god and basically came to earth and raped earth women and created the Nephilim. And that was part two of that uh, period in history that created another deluge, because that's what was going on before Noah's flood was the Nephilim. And that, and that, and, and you know, they, 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 they raped the earth women and the women gave birth to these monsters, these, these carnivorous bloodthirsty creatures. And the Lord, Creator God said, mm, can't have that. We're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And there was the second flood, which we call Noah's flood. And what I find interesting is that at the beginning of the Bible, everybody lived to be like 900 and something, like Methuselah lived to be 960. But then after Noah's flood, mm, nobody lived past 120. So there was clearly a genetic downgrade to the human DNA because the telomeres and whatever it is that says we're going to live this long or that long was gone. Okay. Yeah. And then today, I mean, you know, you're lucky if you take good care of yourself that you live to be a hundred. I mean, I don't know how lucky that is. I guess it depends on how healthy you are, but it, we're definitely been downgraded, which is yeah. why the prophecies talk about uh, that when, when the Messiah King returns with his legions thousands of legions of angels, ETs, the good ETs, because remember, one third rebelled, two thirds did not. So they're the good guys. They're the good ETs. And they're the, they're also returning. So, so that's one of the prophecies is that when he returns, he comes to restore all things and restore us back to our original state. So we've been downgraded. And when the geneticists look at our DNA and they go, hmm, that's junk DNA because they don't understand it. Well, God didn't make junk, but the Anunnaki disabled it. Yeah. Okay. To make us more uh, malleable, controlled, uh, and, and to become like servants in a slave race. They took away our powers. OK, so a lot of us are, you know, starting to get little glimpses of things here and there. You got to work at it, you know, all of that. But when he returns, he comes to restore. And it says that there will be no more night. I mean, all of this curse stuff. And it is a curse. There was a curse. Dole, the curses were doled out on the earth, on on men, on uh, women uh, on the animals. So the, the, the scripture says that all of creation moans and groans for the redemption of the Lord to, because they all want to come out of this, this state. So, so he is the great liberator. And, and it's actually, and I, then I went into the astrology cosmology of all of this, that it was written into the star pictures. So that, oh. you know, it's, it's a universal message. It's not, yeah. Uh, just for Earth, I want to ask you about uh, you know Stephen Greer and, and the um, you know the, the sort of the, the division here between like okay 
all this, all the ETs are good ETs, but then there's the, you know, there's the bad ETs, there's the whole abduction phenomena. Um, and, and, and do you think it's okay then for groups to go out? Like I heard you sort of talk about Greer and his groups and be interesting to hear your take on that. But if they're going out to, to try and summon UFOs or look for UFOs with like loving intention and, and a good, you know, good hearts, they're not going out for any nefarious purposes. You think that's okay? Or would you just say like, leave all that alone? <laughs> that's a great question, Graham. Um, I would say leave it alone because you don't know what you're playing with. Okay. And because the deception factor is so great and people's discernment is so low and the wishful thinking is so high, the desire to meet ET, to, to contact any ET, regardless of who they are, what their intentions are, you know, and, and how they have these powers to shape shift. I mean, there's a script, a famous scripture in the Bible that says, okay, no. So the word Satan is Hebrew for adversary. Okay. So these are titles, not necessarily names. Okay. So that's why in my book, I always, um, uh, I don't give it a capital S and I put in, I put, I make it plural because there's, there's more than one adversary. There's, there's, you know, there, there's like a hierarchy of them, but there's a lot of them. Okay. So, so it says that they have the ability to um, manifest as angels of light. Okay. Satan can masquerade. This is the scripture in, in Corinthians. Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. Okay. Well, we see today that reptilians and this has been well documented, and this is in the book you have, and David Icke uh, uh, wrote about it, talked about it, that they have this ability to shape shift. Okay, so we had a, a, a TV. I was say the truth is stranger than fiction. There was um, the 1980s uh, TV series V. V. Yeah. Did you yeah. see it? Oh yeah. Have you seen it? Well, that that couldn't be like closer to the truth. I mean, it it it, it was so because they manifested, they came in and they played right into the human desire to have contact with benevolent, good looking uh, extraterrestrials, right? And they all come in their spacesuits and they're all kind of, you know, beautiful oh, and healing, sexy. They're healing people. And, right, right. Yeah. And they're healing people and they're doing good. At least they appear to be. But then we see at the end that, it, that they're really not human they're, they're, they're lizards, they're reptilians, and they're carnivorous, and they came to absorb humans. So, so this is part of what the Monroe Institute coined the phrase louche. And this is in the book you have that I expose that part of the abduction uh, scenario and part of the situation here is that they keep us subjugated and suppressed because we're like a human farm. And they want they want to come and siphon our louche. Yeah. And, and that's our emotional energy, our soul energy, the stuff that makes us human. So like we're souls having a human experience because you, 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 you don't die when you die. Your soul goes on depending on where you're at and where you go, because there's multiple places to go. Not everybody goes to the same place afterwards, but you still are a soul and you're a spirit and you have a body. So the body is temporary. The soul and the spirit isn't. And they know that they know how we're wired. So they want to do, they, they press buttons, they manipulate, they do all kinds of things to get our loose. So are we going to get anywhere with disclosure with the government, with what's happening now with the, have you been following that in, in detail, like the latest? I have. Yes. I, I think it's, you know, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. And um, there's, there's a, 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 a hearing that's coming up in the fall um, that uh, is by the Senate uh, uh, um uh, Senator Schumer, and he, you know they're going to make a new rule. This is in my book. You you have that. So once that happens, that's going to be another shoe to drop. I also have heard um, through the grapevine that there's about 40 whistleblowers that are preparing to come forward, and they're uh, being vetted and uh, interviewed behind the scenes. 
So at some point, I don't know when, they'll come, they'll surface. But you know, our Congress is now paying attention to this. And this is the only issue that is bipartisan in our Congress. Because you, when we started this, you talked about the division. And there's been division like we've never seen in the history of America between uh, the two parties here. But the UFO phenomenon is the only thing that is bipartisan, that is that, that, that both Democrats and Republicans are working together on. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. Well, the, in, the implications are huge. Free energy and all this kind of clean energy, you know, technology, spiritual advancement. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge topic. Yes. Yes, it is. So we're unfolding. I mean, this is all preparing us for the end of the age. And we deserve, we need to, to, to get, you know, we need help. We need yeah, help. I, well, I agree. That's why it's, it gets frustrating. It's like, well, come and are, I'm, I'm looking forward to when it just, when, when it's out there and everybody sees it and everybody like really believes because there's less people, it seems there's more people from sort of the normal side of things believing, but there's less people that have, that have been involved in this believing now, like the people with, with the government action, like it's just harder to, harder to believe. Darren, Darren, do you have any questions before we wrap it up? No, well, how long do I have? <laughs> how long? Yeah, do have how long do we have? You mean as a planet? No, just personally, you know, like personally, or I get caught up in the, <laughs> in the age of the pole flip. Or have you have you followed have you followed the Diehold Foundation, for example? Because he yeah. talks about the pole flip happening. A full pole reversal because of the sun's uh, micronovas, I think, is what he calls it. Oh, yes. I follow that very closely, but Douglas not, Voigt, not he, from that foundation, but from says, other sources. He yes. says 1946. Uh, he says 2046. Okay. Well, um, in my fifth book, I give that um, 2040 to 2046 range. Uh, based on um, Jason Bashir's research. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We had him on, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. very good at this. Okay. So, but here's another piece that I, I can add to this is that all of the so called experts were predicting that the warming was that we have just achieved this summer with the 128 degrees and, and the uh, the ocean waters being so hot and also the warming moving uh, from the equator up uh, north, and this is due to the pole shift because we've gone from 40, we, 40 degrees into it. So we've gone from the Canadian Arctic, the North Magnetic Pole has moved to uh, Siberia. So that's like a 40 degree shift. And each time, you know, we're having these perturbations, the earth is wobbling. And as the earth wobbles, it's shifting. And and so the climate change, the, the whole equator uh, is, is weather has now moved north, which is what we were seeing in the Gulf of Mexico this summer. So I heard that the numbers that they predicted for the warming for this summer was supposed to happen in 2028, but it's 2023. So we're five years ahead of where they said we need to be. So things are accelerating, okay? So I, I do feel that the 2040, 2046 uh, dates could very well uh, happen. It may even happen sooner, um, but, you know, like uh, 2029, 2030, there is an asteroid. So let's, let's not forget that this, this is a system that is intersecting in our solar system. And so it, it, it works the opposite. So it has a tail. That's why it has the two, the split wings. And that's a, like, it's a comet planet. So um, uh, um, the, the uh, 1940s uh, Chilean astronomer, he coined that phrase, um, Carlos Muñez Ferrada. He called it a comet planet. And so what happens, it doesn't operate like a regular comet where the head comes first and the tail comes second. The tail comes first and the head comes second. And the tail comes in to the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud, and we're seeing all this stuff, we're seeing an uptick, a market uptick in fireballs, meteorites, 
uh, comets, asteroids. And so 2030, there's supposed to be an asteroid that, that comes through. Um, this is also another part of our uh, uh, government um, space program is DART, in, and they are working uh, daily on trying to uh, avert uh, asteroids, uh, nudge them off of their orbit so that they don't come into our space and try to blow them up, just like in the movie Armageddon, you know? So, um, but without like suicide stuff, you know, like yeah. <laughs> just I, using yeah, think, technology, not people. So I, I think Brashear's, Brashear's Phoenix event happens at one on 2040. And then this Douglas Voigt, uh, Voigt happens on 2046. So interesting. You got those. Well, it's interesting stuff. because uh, Brashear's actually gave a range. He has a book about that it's 2040 to 2046. Oh, okay. And yeah. I use that in my fifth book, The Heavens. And I thought, I just question this. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm just saying, could it be that is the seven year tribulation that the Bible predicts? And then I connected it with some data that I received from some uh, inside astronomer who uh, goes by the name of Mike from around the world. He only speaks to one person on the podcast, which is this pastor. But he says that, and that because he's like, works for NASA, so he can't really like reveal who he really is. But he says that what they're seeing is that this thing is going to come around the sun, which to me makes perfect sense. Okay. It's going to come, it's, it's going to pass the sun twice. So I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to pass the earth twice as it goes around the sun. So it goes around the sun the first time. And as it, uh, the sun gives it energy, and catapults it back into its orbit and sends it back out. And then it passes the earth the second time. And that is what the Old Testament prophets call the terrible day of the Lord. It's a day, right? And, and it, it's repeated throughout the whole Old Testament. All the prophets talked about it. And so this guy says that, that when they track this, they are estimating that that is going to take 24 to 36 hours okay for for it once the sun catapults it back out to pass the earth and and i thought okay let's call that a day 24 to 36 hours and 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 then the book of isaiah talks about that the lord is going to turn the earth upside down which is biblical vernacular for pole shift which means that the that that will be the final earthquake because there's going to be a great quake, like the, the biggest ever, you know, like we had a number nine in Chile, like I think 2004, and it knocked the earth off the axis and it actually shaved, uh, like I think about 20, 30 seconds off of our day. So the, that's why, you know, people feel like time is speeding up, the days are getting shorter and they are. I mean, time is changing as we know it. So uh, it is possible that that what Jason Brashears predicted about this seven year, because you start with uh, 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 2040 to 2046, that's seven years, that that could be the seven year tri tribulation period that is predicted in, in the Bible prophecy. I don't know, but leave that's it at that. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, we should do this again sometime. This has been great. Oh, sure. I'd love yeah. to talk to you again. Before the poll shift. Yeah, before the poll shift. Yeah. Yes, this definitely. <laughs> this has been great. Ella, where can our listeners track you down? Do you have a website or any social media, anything like that? Thank you, Darren. Yes, uh, I'm on who's who uh, in the cosmic zoo.com. And uh, you can uh, find my books also on Amazon uh, in the world wide channels, um, Kindle, paperback, and I believe audio uh, through the subscription. And I'm also on Facebook, who's who in the Cosmic Zoo, and just find me. I have two pages, Ella LeBane. I post okay. a lot of pictures of what's happening around the sun. Um, and your book is like an encyclopedia. I mean, you've got all the different races. Like if, if anybody wants to know anything about kind of ETs, the races, disclosure, uh, the religious aspect, the archons, I mean, you've got everything in there, so. Yeah. Well, it's a start. <laughs> <laughs> so are you are you writing another book about uh, Messianic Jews, too, in the future? Um, not necessarily per se. I am doing another book. Uh, I have two books coming down the pike. Um, 
a, a book on breaking um, uh, generational curses and healing uh, trauma and, and getting implants etheric implants removed. And that's called Finding Freedom When Horses Don't Fly. Um, so that's uh, coming hopefully by Christmas. Um, and then the sixth book of the series, I'm saving for 2024 release, which is The End Times Guide to the Maserot, which is all about the cosmology, the star names that we touched upon a little bit about the message in the stars and mm -hmm. how like salvation is not just for us. It's not just for earth humans. It's, you know, the whole universe. Right on. Thanks. Thank you for it's having cool. me. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. It's, take care. Thanks. Ella. Come back. Thank anytime. You. God bless. And that was our chat with Ella LeBane. What'd you think, buddy? Yeah, that was fantastic. It was great. I had a, I had a bunch of questions. We got to do it again. I could tell you, yeah. you know, UFOs. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, well, this was beyond UFOs because she goes really deep into everything, you know, into the disclosure. I, I have a contact in the desert shirt here for you. Oh, do you? Oh, cool. Yeah. I was wearing my uh, my con Congress uh, 2013 UFO Congress shirt. pre gray America. Predates gray America. It bar like barely bar predates. Bar predates. Yeah. Big thanks to Ella for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks if you're one of the few who choose to support our work. Go America.ca slash support. If you choose to join the ranks, you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month or $100 a month, a billion dollars a month. Whatever uh, floats your boat, you decide. You can do a one-time donation. Uh, if you don't want to do that, head over to adultbrain.ca if you want to check out our audiobooks and our audiobook cod podcast. Go to grammaricaoutlaw.ca if you want to get into all the conspiracy stuff. And uh, contact at thecabin.com for all the trips. We've got a good one coming up in uh, Canada that's starting to get close and starting to get, seems like, a lot of tire kickers. So you might want to get in there and uh, get a spot secured before it's too late. I think we're down to nine, eight or nine spots on that. So contact at thecabin.com. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week.